Welcome to Night Light. Step away from the mainstream and gather around as we enlighten the world and our realities and travel this cosmic journey we call life. Join us as we share with you and provide that beacon that can guide us all to a better way. Explore with us as we examine a metaphysical montage of spiritual insights covering everything from the mundane to the magical, UFOs to unicorns, and everything in between. This is a time of awakening, of sharing and evolving, of spreading our wings and soaring on the cosmic breath of creation. Come and join with other light-minded spirits as we weave our lights together to seek understanding, enlightenment, and with a little luck, some wisdom. This is Night Light, a reminder that you are never alone. Welcome to Nightlight, everybody. Thanks for sharing your evening with us. Um, as you can tell, the pollen has decided to attack me, but I will soldier on here and have a, an unusual gravelly voice for the evening. First, I want to thank Ken Quiethawk for that amazing introduction and also for his service to the country. I also want to remind you to check out his website, which is www.nativestorytellers.com. He and his wife are Native storytellers, and they preserve history in the most unique way. Everybody should listen to them and learn from them because they are amazing people. Very excited tonight about my guest. I have Tim Schwartz on, and he's an Indian and a Native, and an Emmy Award-winning television producer, videographer, and is the author of a number of popular books, including The Lost Journals of Nikola Tesla, America's Strange and Supernatural History, Secret Black Projects, Evil Agenda of the Secret Government, Time Travel, A How-To Guide, Richard Shaver, Reality of the Inner Earth, Admiral Byrd's Secret Journey Between the Poles, and is a contributing writer for books Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, The First Ghostbuster, Brad Steiger's Real Monsters, Gruesome Critters, and Beasts from the Dark Side, and Real Ghosts, Restless Spirits, and Haunted Places. As well as, he is a a photojournalist and has traveled extensively and investigated paranormal phenomena and other unusual mysteries from such diverse locations as the Great Pyramid in Egypt to the Great Wall in China. He's worked with television networks such as PBS, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, ESPN, Thames TV, and the BBC. And he's also appeared on the History Channel's program, Ancient Aliens, and on a History Channel Latin American series. He has written a great deal. He has investigated a great deal. And in his spare time, he also has written the book that we're initially going to be talking about tonight, Jeff the Talking Mongoose, The Eighth Wonder of the World. Um, It's a fascinating book. I I truly encourage everybody to read it. If If you're at all interested in the paranormal, this is one that sticks out from all the rest because it doesn't fit into any category at all. And you'll hear that and and see it in just a few minutes. So welcome to the show. Tim, I'm so glad you're here. Well, I thank you very much. Uh, it's a, it's a pleasure to be uh, with you. I think I should have sent you uh, the the short version of my uh, uh, bio to uh, uh, because your poor your poor voice. I'm so sorry that the pollen is getting oh, no, to you. No. My, uh, my voice does not hurt. It's just annoying. Um, but but no, I did shorten your bio so. Um, just a little bit, but you know it's an amazing bio, and you've done so much, and you've you've been curious and investigated so many different things. It's you know it's it's 
hard to pick and choose because all of it is so fascinating. I want to talk about all of it. Mm-hmm. Oh, only yeah. Got well, and, and, I, and I love all of it, too. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, isn't it so cool that you get to do what gives you the greatest pleasure? It really is, um, you know, because I've I have been fascinated by this kind of stuff for for a long, long time. Not not quite as long as as some people that I'm sure you've interviewed who have said, "Oh yeah, I mean, you know, as soon as I uh, uh, was old enough to you know toddle around out of my crib, I've been fascinated by you know ghosts and UFOs <laughs> and stuff." It, it it took me just a little bit longer than that, but not by much. Well, I've only been involved for 50 years, so, you know, it's not, you know, I haven't got that much time under my belt either, but it, it <laughs> since I taught school for 25 years, so, you know, once I had to leave school because I had a car accident, and it was the best thing that could have ever happened to me in my whole life, I got mm-hmm. to do what I love the most mm-hmm. full time. And I think that that it's what makes for a long lifetime, to be honest with you, because what, what do they say? If you follow your bliss, you never work a day in your life. That's right. That's right. And and I, I would I would totally believe that. I mean, some of the things that you've looked into are things that I am act- actually fascinated by as well. Um, and and it's it's hard to pick and choose and say just where I want to go first. Except <clears throat> Mark Mark read. Jeff, the talking mongoose, the eighth wonder of the world. And then I became fascinated with it, and I decided that I had to read it too. And you know, if I have to read a book, then I have to do a radio show on it. And <laughs> I kept trying to analyze it. And um, it, it doesn't, as I said before, it doesn't fit into any category. It's, mm. It stands alone as, as an event uh, an oddity, uh, whatever you want to call it, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It, it takes a little bit from a lot of different modalities, and mm-hmm. you have this amazing, amazing um, manifestation. And 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 at one point, um, the people were were trying to figure out exactly what this this entity was. And was it ever suggested that he was an egregore? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, at the uh, when this all took place, which uh, it actually started in in 1931, um, uh-huh. if if anybody was was thinking along the lines of say the paranormal. Uh, the the first inclination would have been to describe it as a ghost, but uh, naturally the you know, popular press at the time uh, tended more towards trying to find a more uh, mundane explanation, like uh, the, uh, the 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 young daughter of the household, Vori Irving, uh, yeah. they suggested that that she was a ventriloquist. Which, if that well, was the case, she would have been the greatest ventriloquist yes. in the world. <laughs> let's, 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 for those who haven't had the pleasure of reading this book, and I strongly suggest you get out there and read it because it is the coolest story ever. And it's not a ghost story, but it, it is a paranormal story for sure. Um, it started in 1931 on the mm-hmm. Isle of Wight. Um, Isle of Man. In a, in Isle, a of very, Man. Isle of Man, sorry. And in a very remote cottage, it wasn't. It was near a town, but it was it was remote from the town. Right. Yeah. It, uh, the closest town would have been uh, Dalby, uh, mm-hmm. which was uh, still a number of miles away, and and the farmhouse was extremely extremely isolated. Um, there there was no road uh, leading up to the farmhouse. You couldn't drive a car up there. The closest you could get was uh, about a mile or so away, but and then you would have to walk basically uphill, uh, up a narrow path that uh, during the rainy season was actually a little stream 
that ran down the hill. Okay. So there, yeah, there, it, 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 it was extremely isolated. And the farmhouse itself, uh, which went by the name of uh, Cajun's Gap, uh, was probably built in the 19th century, though there are some indications that it may have been built uh, even earlier than that. Uh, it was uh, a fairly large farmhouse, actually, for considering uh, where it was located uh, and compared to uh, other farmhouses in the general vicinity. It, uh, it had two stories, uh, which, which was unique. And uh, when um, the Irvings first bought this house, now you had uh, uh, James Irving and his wife, Margaret. They originally lived in Liverpool, England. Uh, Jim Irving was a traveling salesman. He sold uh, pianos and organs and uh, was was very successful at it. Uh, both of them were, were well-educated. Um, they uh, Jim knew... Uh, several different uh, languages, and uh, unfortunately, after World War One, Jim uh, found that uh, his his business ha was declining sharply. Naturally, uh, so they decided that they would take his retirement money and they would buy this isolated farmhouse uh, on the island. Margaret Irving, his wife, had uh, family. That, that lived on the island, and while they were visiting one time, they found out that this farmhouse was for sale, so Jim got it in his head that he would become a gentleman farmer, which meant that uh, they would have hired hands that would do all the work, and he would, you know, he would bring it, he'd just reap in the profits, that sort of thing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the, that didn't quite turn out the way that they had hoped. The, the, the farm wasn't very profitable. Uh, they chiefly raised uh, uh, sheep and goats, you know, with, with you know, some chickens and things like that. But mostly it was uh, uh, sheep and, and goats that uh, uh, they were living in. And it, it just ended up not being very profitable. So they, they really didn't have any hired hands. And Jim and Margaret uh, chiefly were the ones that, uh, that took care of the farm. Um, not too long after they moved into this into this farm they had they had two children that were already grown that lived on the island with them for a short period of time but then their two children went back to england and got married and started families of their own and around that time margaret discovered that she was pregnant and subsequently they uh, they had a daughter uh by the name of of vori and so then uh, everything just, you know, was just kind of a, just a regular kind of uh, lonely, uh, kind of isolated uh, life there uh, in this location until around 1931. Vori was around 12 years old. And uh, as Jim Irving would later report, he said that uh, uh, one day him and his daughter saw this they described it as kind of like a, a, a little weasel type of, of, of animal. It was about maybe uh, nine inches long with a big uh, kind of like a fluffy tail, uh, maybe kind of a, a yellowish, uh, brownish orange in color. And it was a running around uh, uh, harassing the, the chickens and ducks and you know geese and the other livestock. And they said that it was making um, – Various noises. It would bark like a dog and meow like a cat and 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 other things. So uh, Jim went in to to grab his shotgun and shoot it, but by the time he got back outside, it had disappeared. Uh, later, it became apparent that whatever this thing was, it had moved into uh, the farmhouse. Now. I need to go back just a little bit there, uh, Barbara. When the Irvings first bought this farmhouse, it uh, stone construction, very old. The inside walls were stone as well. So in the wintertime, it would get very cold. So uh, Jim had uh, put paneling on the inside and left about a four-inch gap between this wooden paneling and then the original stone walls kind of serve as, uh, you know, as, as insulation. 
Mm-hmm. Whatever this thing was, it had gotten inside of the house and was now living in between uh, the pa- wooden paneling and the walls. And they could hear it scrabbling around and you know and making noises and stuff. So you know they thought, well, you got you know we've got some kind of critter in the house. We better get rid of it. So yeah. they tried the obvious things. They put up uh, traps and poison. Nothing worked. This thing uh, was smart enough to avoid them all. Well, eventually Jim got frustrated, and uh, one evening when uh, he heard this thing fairly close by, he barked at it like a dog, and this thing barked back. That was when he realized that this was the same creature that they had seen outside. So he tried it again, and once again, this thing mimicked a dog barking back. Well, they started uh, uh, doing another, you know, meowing like a cat, you know, uh, 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 buying like a sheep, bleeding like a goat. Uh, this thing obviously had some kind of uh, a talent to uh, to mimic noises. Eventually, they noticed that on top of that, it was making sounds almost like the way a baby would gurgle. As it was, as a ba- you know, human baby is learning how to talk. So Vori yeah. started reciting nursery rhymes to it, and eventually this thing started mimicking a human voice with these nursery rhymes, and that's how it started. And eventually, whatever this thing was, it developed a personality. Um, uh, a consciousness, intelligence, whatever. Yeah, it, it, it later claimed that it could understand people talking, you know, all along. But it wasn't until the Irvings actually tried to to teach it to talk that it learned how to speak. Uh, Jim Irving uh, at first called whatever this thing was Jack, uh, J A C K, but uh, this creature <laughs> later would say that it didn't like the name Jack, Jack, and it preferred the name Jeff. And when it said Jeff, uh, it was to be spelled, you know, like the old-fashioned way of spelling Jeff, G-E-O-F-F. But uh, uh, Jeff spelled it out phonetically, and he spelled it G-E-F, and that's how the name stuck. Uh, now, I know a lot of people, when they read my book or read these accounts, they're not quite sure how to pronounce it. They want to give it a hard G, call it, you know, like Jeff, but it's Jeff, like uh, J-E-F-F, Jeff. And it identified itself as a mongoose. It said that uh, it had lived on the island for a number of years, and in fact, it was uh, incredibly old. I, I think at that point, it, it said that it was already 80-plus years old. Uh, and, but you know that, in a nutshell, is how the whole Jeff the Mo- Talking Mongoose case um, had its start. And it just escalated from there. <laughs> well, I, what I found fascinating was that apparently – it could read as well. And because many times, it, you know, he would, I think at one point someone was looking at a newspaper and he got very upset because someone named Jeffrey had died. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, and uh, was, you know, his name. Right. Well, and, and, uh, for uh, for the people who uh, always uh, uh, like to say that that Jeff was haunting or a ghost of some kind, uh, whatever this thing was, whatever Jeff was, he always claimed that he wasn't a ghost, and in fact he uh, was terrified of ghosts. And the the Irvings had brought in one time a book about ghosts, and like you said, Jeff could read to a certain extent, obviously and saw what this book was about and demanded that they get rid of it because it, it, it scared him too much. So how <laughs> how ironic is that, that you have something that uh, seems to be ghost-like or paranormal-like, yet claims to be afraid of all of that? <laughs> well, and not only that, but he was able to manifest sounds in all different parts of the house, almost, you know, almost at the same time. So either he was the speediest thing in the world or was able to, in some way, energetically. Now, he was inside the walls, so 
it may have, you know, been echoes to a certain degree, but mm-hmm. but he was able to do things that one would think would be almost spiritual or paranormal or of a of a of a paranormal um, instance. And you know, when you when you heard about you know chairs being thrown or or objects being moved or whatever. Everybody is going to immediately go to it's it's a polter, it's a poltergeist. Of course, it's a poltergeist, but it wasn't a poltergeist because. Well, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Barbara. Well, well uh, in many cases, it ate food, and poltergeists mm-hmm. don't eat food. I mean, that to me was the 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 you know red flag that said it's not a poltergeist. Can't be a poltergeist. I mean, Vori was of an age where you would, ex- if there was going to be any kind of strange activity, you would point to the the adolescent and say, "Oh, it's her energy, and that's that's why all of these strange things are happening." But everybody was seeing them, and and everybody was talking to Jeff, and and Jeff was doing things like. Um, hunting for rabbits and leaving them for the, for them so that they would find them and be able to, you know, have them for stew or whatever. Um, he, he became a part of the family in a very strange way. Right from the very beginning, the Irvings thought that Jeff was a ghost, that they, that they were being haunted. Uh, and, and, you know, like you said, I mean, it, it's natural to come to that kind of conclusion considering the types of phenomena that occurred um, around uh, Jeff. Uh, as you said, that uh, he could make all kinds of different noises at various parts of the house almost simultaneously. Uh, you know, a favorite trick of the poltergeist is to create uh-huh. the sound that's uh, you know it sounds like uh, maybe all of the dishes in your cabinet falling on the floor and shattering you know with this you know this huge cacophony uh, of noise you know Jeff uh, did that a number of times yet when they would go say into the kitchen there was you know there was nothing there you know was, everything was was in its place uh, Jeff could throw things. Um, from these little teeny tiny holes and cracks in the wall, uh, packing needles was a favorite thing that he would like to throw. But uh, I mean, you know, he, he he would throw like little pebbles and uh, 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 spoons, uh, other types of uh, of small, uh, 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 you know, cut cutterly um, uh, from these uh, locations. You know, from the walls, sometimes from the rafters, uh, the wooden rafters and the ceilings where where he would like to hide. Um, uh, the Jim Irving noted also that uh, Jeff apparently had the ability to uh, become not only invisible, uh, but uh, apparently he was a shapeshifter as as well. Uh, there was one time when uh, Jim spotted uh, a large cat. Uh, in the farmyard, uh, and, and he described it as you know like a Manx cat, you know one of those cats with with no tails, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, Jim was going to go and, and shoo it away. He didn't want to do that. He liked cats, but he was afraid that it was you know this was a cat that was going to go and you know try and kill its chickens or something. But he said as he watched it, it uh, it slowly faded away like a ghost. Uh, later that evening, Jeff uh, uh, piped up and said, "That was me you saw, Jim." Uh, there, there was another, there was another time when a, a couple of young men from the uh, nearby village came to visit, and they were sitting in the living room uh, talking, and one of the men was uh, stroking something on his lap that nobody else could see, and they were like, uh, "Okay, what are you doing?" He's like, "Well, I'm petting their cat," but nobody else could see this cat that he could see on his lap. And again, later on, Jeff claimed that uh, that that was him, that the uh, this, you know, who able to disguise himself as a cat that only this one young man uh, could see. So you have this this really odd phenomena of something that is both physical, yet also seems to be um, 
paranormal for want of a better word you know it's kind of like a uh, uh you know something that's both a ghost yet is also able to manifest itself physically and you know in in a couple of places too it dis- it described it, it went through such such very human things at one point he was coughing up he had a cough or something and they gave him peppermints for his cough and in another mm-hmm. place they had left cookies or, or or something for him and he couldn't find it and they gave him a box of matches and he lit a match he found what he was looking for and he threw the matches back to them <laughs> now if he did paranormal that wouldn't have happened to him well, one of the other odd things about Jeff was that um, even though it it looked like a like a little like a little animal like a mongoose or or, or a ferret, uh, its its paws in, had fingers and yeah. had what appeared to be like maybe an opposable thumb, something that you know a, a normal creature that, you know doesn't have. Uh, you had talked about how. He was trying to find something, and so they threw him a match, and he was able to light it. Uh, you know, somebody with paws, though I've got some cats that uh, if, if <laughs> they could probably learn how to light <laughs> matches sometimes. <laughs> they can certainly I open doors. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, um, you know, there was one time where they had, in the house, the Irvings had an enclosed staircase, and at the top of this staircase was an area, a flat area, that Jeff uh, uh, liked to liked to stay. Uh, you know, he, it was his little enclave, so to speak. And one evening, they had given him some something to eat, and it was like a porridge in a bowl. And they had given him a lit candle so he could see, uh, a very unghost-like, so he could see uh, this porridge and and and, uh, and and a spoon so he could eat it. And in this candlelight, they could see his shadow. As he ate this porridge, and at one point he held his paw up with the spoon in it, and then held, and then put the spoon down, and held his paw up, and they could see his his little fingers, and uh, and there were times where they they the Irving said that they could see his fingers. He'd stick his little his little paws or hands out from the uh, uh, cracks in the wall, and they said they looked more like 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 dolls' hands rather than the paws uh, of a type of creature. So, you know, once again, here we have something that that is just kind of this weird mishmash of, of things. I mean, supposedly it's a physical animal, yet it acts like a ghost, but it instead of having paws, it has fingers, and on top of all, you know, on top of everything else, it obviously has intelligence and can talk. Now, the voice, as people would describe it, they said it was very shrill, high-pitched, you know, something that sounded like it was coming from the throat of an animal. And a lot of people at first, when they would come to visit the house and and Jeff, you know, would deem them... um, um, (laughs) Uh, what's the word I'm th- was, uh, uh, able to to hear him because Jeff didn't like visitors and he would not talk to just anybody. Uh, but some visitors he would talk to, but if, some of them at first couldn't understand him uh, because his voice was so high pitched. After a while, you know, you would get used to how he sounded, and then you could understand him. You know, kind of like you know some. Uh, uh, parrots or parakeets that uh, uh, mm-hmm. are able to talk, but they're you know you, you know how their their voices a lot of times are very you know high pitched and at and at first it's hard to distinguish the words. It was rather like that with Jeff, uh, but rather but in you know a parrot or a parakeet merely mimics uh, what it is heard and just kind of says the same phrases over and over again. Jeff would have intelligent, very intelligent. Uh, philosophical, uh, 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 in fact, conversations with people, not only the Irvings, but uh, some visitors as well that, that Jeff grew to to knew and li- uh, know and like, though well, he al- that he was also very had, few and, and far and between. <laughs> he also had a, a sort of intuitive sense to him, too, because he knew, he knew people were coming before they actually arrived. 
Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Um, sometimes he knew that they were arriving because he could read and, uh, you know, uh, say some paranormal <laughs> investigators would send a letter uh, announcing that they'd be showing up at a certain time, you know, a couple of weeks. And, and Jeff would read that and he would disappear and and not show up, much to the chagrin of the Irvings. Uh, who, who really, they were often disappointed that Jeff would not talk to, uh, especially some of the more rel- well respected uh, parapsychologists that 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 you know would come to visit them, uh, which was unfortunate because that led a lot of people to believe that the whole thing was just a hoax. Uh, the Irvings had to put up with that. Uh, conceit through throughout the entire time of this phenomena, which I should note uh, lasted for a number almost ten years. Uh, w- very and which is very unlike you know a poltergeist or or, or, or yeah. other types of, of hauntings. Uh, but there there were a number of of uh, very well renowned people respected you know in the community that uh, uh did hear jeff speak and and a couple of them actually were able to catch catch a glimpse of him but uh unfortunately people say like uh the the very well known ghost hunter harry price and uh, then uh, later the uh, parapsychologist nandor forder actually you know took the time to come to the island to to visit jeff but jeff would refuse to talk to them uh, with harry price jeff just just completely disappeared and didn't show up again till about 2 or 3 weeks after harry price had left the island which really angered margaret irving though the wife of the household she um, as, 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 as you said, Barbara, in an earlier conversation that we had, you know, she was a very no nonsense uh, type of woman, and she kind of put up with Jeff. Though Jeff obviously uh, loved Margaret and and would talk to her often, and in fact would get very upset when Margaret was was mad at him. Uh, but uh, uh, Margaret. When Jeff would refuse to to talk to uh, some of these uh, parapsychologists who would come to visit, afterwards she would just basically say to Jeff, "Why don't you just leave?" And he says, "You bother us yeah. all the time. When somebody shows up that you know that that is trying to find out what is going on with us, you just disappear. You know, you make us look like we're crazy to these people. Why don't you just go? We're sick of this." And Jeff would just like burst into tears, I guess, from what I was reading, and beg Margaret forgiveness. Uh, yet, well, you know, <clears throat> time again, he would just he would do the same thing over and over. But he was very reluctant to actually be identified because when they asked to, and, and before I even go in into that, I have found that um, my animals will react to someone whose energy is not, you know, if somebody is is. It's going through, you know, huge emotional stuff. My cats are not around. So, mm-hmm. so animals yep. are very, very sensitive to, um, to different energies. And I, I don't recall ever seeing anything in the book that said anything about their dog being upset by Jeff being there. Right, right. Yeah, they 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 had a a, a sheepdog by the, by the name of yeah. Mona, um, and and you know you're you're absolutely uh, uh, correct. I mean there there did not seem to be any kind of of interaction between the two, and and in fact, um, you know, uh, Vori and and Mona would would spend uh, all day a lot of times, you know, out walking around. Uh, the, the the hillside and the fields and, and stuff and Jeff would be nearby unseen but uh, he would follow them uh, but you're right I I don't know if I've uh, ever run across any accounts that there was any kind of of negative hostile or or even positive positive interaction uh, well and not only the, that uh, the sheep dog. yeah when they when they asked for samples of Jeff's fur um, Jeff gave them. Mona's fur. Right, um, right. Well, see, 
and that's that's uh, that's another situation that uh, that that constantly angered Margaret, especially Margaret Irving, is that uh, 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 Jeff allegedly provided uh, fur that he said that he took off of his his face and belly. Uh, but when it was analyzed, it was shown to be uh, from a, a dog. And in fact, uh, later when Harry Price uh, came to visit the household, he was able to uh, secretly clip some <laughs> clip some fur from from Mona. And the same um, uh, same scientist who had analyzed the, uh, the the Jeff's fur earlier confirmed that this was the very same. Uh, the, very same fur. It came from the very, you know, from the very same same animal. Well, the same way, <laughs> yeah, from Mona. The same way they had uh, <laughs> Harry Price had also provided some uh, plastiline clay for Jeff to put his uh, paw prints uh, into. Now Jeff uh, said that the that this this plastiline was extremely hard uh, to to leave an imprint on, but uh, but when he did, uh, he left teeth marks too. None of these, none of the paw prints or teeth marks could be identified with any known uh, living animal. The, the the researcher, in fact, said that uh, the closest thing that he could maybe even suggest was that uh, the paw prints, the front paw prints, kind of looked like the paw prints from a raccoon. Which you know is not indigenous to the Isle, uh, Isle of Man. No. Uh, yeah, people didn't even at that time. People didn't even keep them as as pets, uh, unlike now. But uh, uh, so you know, uh, once once again, I mean, when it came to trying to verify uh, Jeff's existence, uh, he was extremely resistant to to do so. And, uh, you know, when the Irvings would ask Jeff, okay, well, what are you? Uh, every time that they would ask him, he would come up with a different answer. He was very cagey about it. About the only thing that he said that he told them that could be confirmed, he said that it, he was originally born in India and that at one point uh, he had been caught with a bunch of others and shipped to the Isle of Man by a local farmer back in, I think they said, uh, maybe in the, you know, like the, the um, 1917, something like that, and and let loose in order to take care of the rabbit population, which had, you know, gone crazy. Uh, Jim Irving later, after Jeff had told him this story, uh, was told by a local reporter that this had indeed actually happened, that there had been a farmer nearby who had bought, you know, like a crate load of mongoose from uh, from India and, ha- and had released them uh, years earlier. Uh, so at least that part of the story seemed to be true. But really, practically a- anything else that uh, that Jeff would would tell about his his origins, what he was, you know, whatever could never be verified and a lot of times just, you know, just discovered just to be, you know, out and out lies. Hmm. I think what, what fascinates me the most is his learning to speak. Um, the mimicking, you know, I can see an animal can learn that, but, but the element of speech and reasoning and he would, he would eavesdrop at people at the bus station or, the railroad station or when men were working, he would, and he'd come back and he would repeat what was being said. Um, and it, how frustrating for the Irvings, but, but they actually, they weren't shunned exactly, but especially Vori must have gotten the worst of the whole thing. Because, <laughs> she you know, she really did. Children yeah. are cruel. Right. I mean. Well, and that's what she said too. <laughs> Um, the uh, uh, you know the inhabitants of the Isle of Man, uh, you know, especially in the nearby village, were already. I mean, the Irvings were to to everybody else. They were outsiders. You know, they they weren't born on the island. They they moved there uh, from 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 England uh, much much later in their life. 
So they were already looked upon, you know, kind of with a sideways glance. So once the uh, the newspapers got a hold of this story that uh, there was something bizarre going on in their household, well, that 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 was even worse uh, uh, for the Irvings. You know, naturally. Most people suspected that it was a hoax of some kind. Uh, one of the uh, the more popular ideas was that this was something that had been concocted by both Margaret and Vory to try to frighten Jim Irving into selling the house and moving them all back to England. Uh, but if that was the case, exactly the opposite happened because Jim became so fascinated uh, by the Jeff phenomena that um, there would have been no way after a while that he would have moved to, to leave it all behind. I mean, Jim actually went as far as to he kept a diary of the day day by day activities of of uh, what Jeff was doing, which uh, this this is a uh, really you know it, it it it's a fascinating part of the book that I was able to include uh this was kept uh, by the way in the uh the Harry Price archives uh which which are now located in England and uh it's what's so fascinating about this is just really how mundane these uh, this diary is because it uh, uh, Jim would write down the time of the day you know the day the month the time of the day uh, just things like you know Jeff killed another rabbit today and told Vory where he had left it uh, uh, Margaret uh, gave him some biscuits and bacon and he got sick later on and threw them up <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> and, and, and you and you would think that if somebody was was trying to hoax something like this, that they would come up with uh, more exciting things to to put into this diary uh, rather than these really just kind of pedestrian uh, uh, recollections of, of, of what was going on uh, that day. Um, now, you had said earlier about uh, uh, Vori and uh, how uh, uh, she may have been treated through all this. Um, her her classmates called her the Dolby Spook, um, and uh, yeah, they you know and, and, and you know like you said, kids kids can be cruel. Now, years later, one of her classmates actually did a radio interview with a, a local radio station there on the island, and she said that Vori was a, um, a really good at um, imitating animal noises and that she could also throw her voice and make animal noises sound like that they were coming out of the closet or you know under the desk across the room and things uh, like that. Uh, now, at that time, uh, people actually did believe that a talented ventriloquist could throw their voice. Uh, rather than, I mean, you know, we know now that it's just a matter of, you know, misdirection. Uh, but, but, but people thought that uh, a ventriloquist could could really throw their voice, which makes me wonder: was uh, uh, was Vori really a ventriloquist, or was there some kind of uh, paranormal phenomena going on that people were thinking? that she was throwing her voice. Maybe uh, maybe Jeff had followed her to school and was making these noises and they thought Vori was doing it. Um, but, uh, the you know, the, all the local newspapers and some of the British tabloids like the Daily Mail uh, often uh, speculated that, that Vori was somehow responsible for the whole Jeff phenomena. Um, but as... As I put in the book, Vori probably could have fooled her parents for maybe a day or so. Um, but you have to realize that uh, Jim and Margaret Irving were, I mean, Jim was in his 60s at this point. Margaret was a little bit younger. They had already raised two children who were now grown. So they didn't just fall off 
you know, the parent wagon. Uh, and, and, and I sincerely doubt that any, you know, 12, 12 year old girl starting out with, you know, continue on through the years would have been able to fool her parents by, you know, mimicking the voice or, you know, throwing things around while they had their backs turned. I mean, you know, you, you, you you have children, Barbara. You know, I, I have a twelve year old yeah. daughter myself. Uh, you know, there's I just cannot believe that a, a a kid could keep up a hoax like that from their parents for all of that time. And I sincerely well, doubt yeah. that that the Irvings would perpetuate a hoax like this all this time because you know what what's the motive? The, uh, Profit. Well, you know, also, also uh, well, no, if they got enough, you know, traffic through there, they might have been able to make some money, but that wasn't the case. But oh, not at Jeff, all. Would, Jeff would kill rabbits and leave them and tell them where they were left. Now, right. Vori couldn't do that, you know, you know, she was in bed asleep, and then, the, you know, Jeff told her where to go and get three or four rabbits that he just killed. So, um even though Mona and, and Vori had a wonderful way of hunting rabbits, you know, with, with the dog sort of hypnotizing the rabbit and her sneaking up behind it. But um, you know, I was wondering, you know, could, could Mr. Irving have been so lonely and challenged by not being intellectually stimulated the way he had been when he was working? And, and once the farm you know, stopped being really a productive farm. Um, his time may have been, you know, there there was probably more time than, than, you know, he had stuff to do. So could his need for something new to come into his life have been so great that he created the energy that, that created Jeff? That is one of the suggestions, in fact, that uh, that came from the parapsychologist uh, Nandor Fordar, who 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 came to visit the farm fairly late or late on. I, I think he he showed up at around 1936, and 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 in fact the the Irvings had told uh, Fordar before he showed up that at this point Jeff had gotten rather surly. And uh, wasn't talking as much, and uh, wasn't making uh, appearances as as often, and that that turned out to be the case uh, when Nandor Fordor showed up. Uh, uh, Jeff uh, never made an appearance. There was maybe a couple of um, you know like uh, um, um, poltergeist type things that went on. You know, back door slammed, you know, three or four times on its own. Some drawers. I guess uh, uh, were were pulled out. And the uh, um, uh, silverware was knocked onto the floor, but but that was about it. Uh, later, now of course, uh, Nandor Fordor was um, was a student of of, of, of Sigmund Freud, and uh, he had developed uh, this uh, the the idea that possibly there was a kind of a combination of of, of psychic and um, psychological uh, situation that was going on with the Irvings. And it's like you said, uh, not, only, not only Jim, but a combination of the, 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 the personalities of Jim, Margaret, and Vori uh, combined due, due to their, their isolations and you know, various other you know, human frustrations uh, uh, may have helped uh, create the Jeff personality, you know, maybe helped along by whatever, you know, uh, maybe other residual types of energies that existed, you know, in the landscape. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I mean, that's uh, um, you know, that and, you know, uh, 50 cents will uh, <laughs> get you half a soda. Well, so, uh, <laughs> well I think one and, of the things that... <clears throat> One of the things that got me was that there were a couple of times when um, they offered, some of the investigators offered to take Vori to England mm-hmm. or to wherever to give her a break from from the farm, and the parents wouldn't let her go alone. 
They insisted. Yeah. That, I, I yeah. think that that to me was a little strange because she was certainly old enough to have gone. Um, G- even, Jim even Irving. In, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Barbara. No, even in the 1930s, you know, by the by this time she was, you know, probably closer to 14, 15, 16 in there someplace. She was very old enough to know what was appropriate and what was not and stuff like that. So for her parents to be that overprotective kind of raised a flag for me. Jim Irving was was extremely protective of Irving. Now, you know, you have to remember that, you know, considering his age at that time, you know, the 1930s, he was already into his 60s. uh, So he probably still had kind of that uh, that Victorian uh, sense of of, of morality, um, but uh, but you're absolutely correct. Uh, it, it was it was Harry Price who had offered to um, to let Bory uh, uh, come to England with a uh, uh, with a female chaperone, so uh-huh. that um, uh, uh, you know she could get away from the island. And, and I think that Harry Price was was actually interested to see if. Um, if Vori left the house, if the Jeff phenomena would continue in the house, if it would uh, follow her, you know, to to England, you know, it 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 would just would have been an interesting experiment just to see exactly uh, what would happen with Jeff at that at really at the height of his energy, uh, if you know Vori were to leave for an extended period of time, you know, what what would happen to Jeff? Uh, but unfortunately, uh, Jim Irving um, uh, would not allow that to happen, and, and in fact, he he would not even allow when uh, uh, some of these investigators came to the island. He would never allow uh, these these gentlemen to interview Vori on her own. Uh, he always had to be there with them. Um, uh, to uh, um, you know, to chaperone, uh, I I suppose, and and in fact, you know, the majority of the time when questions were asked, they were they they were generally always directed uh, towards uh, Mr. Irving. Now, uh, Margaret uh, was interviewed uh, a, a few times, and we we you know we really we got some wonderful stories uh, from her, uh, but. Um, Jim seemed to be the one who uh, uh, would really, you know, take over the conversations and, uh, um, uh, you know, keep, you know, keep the women folk in line, so to speak. Uh, but uh, you know, that was that was noted um, uh, by especially Harry Price when it came to really any kind of of daily interactions. Uh, in the Irving household. I mean, you know, Jim Irving was the patriarch of the household, and that's the way it was. You know, uh, Margaret Irving was uh, the wife. She was in the kitchen, and that's where she stayed. And Vori was a 12-year-old girl who was to be uh, uh, seen but not heard. Now, after he died, after Mr. Irving died, did Jeff disappear as well? Well, um, Jim Irving passed away, I think it was in 1941. Um, Jeff had already um, pretty much disappeared by that point. Uh, as as I said earlier, when uh, Nandor Fordor came to visit in 1936, uh, Jeff had uh, um, become more uh, he would disappear for longer and longer uh, periods so by the time that uh, Jim Irving had gotten sick uh, Jeff had already you know pretty much disappeared uh, a few years earlier uh, Vori who was old enough at this point had moved to England to uh, to work in a machine factory uh, for the, uh, the the war efforts you know, uh, um, the, the war between Germany and Great Britain at that point. And um, once she had left, there, there never, there was never any uh, voice phenomena uh, associated with Jeff. Some of the physical 
ghost or poltergeist type of activity continued on and and in fact uh, their their oldest daughter Elsie who had uh, who had come back uh, she at this point she was a widow and she had come back uh, to the island to live with her parents to to help her mother while uh, uh, while Jim was basically you know passing away now Elsie had never been a believer in Jeff she had always thought that somehow uh, Vori was was faking it all and was you know was able to you know fool her parents all of this time, but she later admitted that while she was there, she observed some uh, some unusual uh, 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 phenomena, things moving around, uh, uh, household items disappearing and reappearing. But she never um, she never heard Jeff, and in fact, uh, years before when when Jeff was at his most active and the older children would come to visit again Jeff would never um would never talk to him uh he, huh. he would um he would throw things at them both the older children reported uh, that that a number of times uh, they got hit in the head by various little items that were, you know, flung from the walls or, you know, or, or from the rafters. But uh, as with a lot of other visitors, Jeff uh, would never speak. He was very cagey uh, when he came to speaking. Um, there, there were there, there was a couple of incidents when uh, some reporters and other town folks had come to visit the Irvings, and they were outside the house uh, with Margaret and Jim and Vori, everybody was outside, yet they could hear Jeff inside the house as they described it. They could hear the animal inside screaming and cursing in its high pitched voice. Huh. Now 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 is the is the cottage still standing? No, no. It um it was tore down probably sometime in the 1970s. Um, it had been unoccupied uh, for for a number of years, and the land had been bought by another farmer who who lived you know someplace else, and uh, um, uh, eventually just uh, just tore the tore the house down. Uh, uh, some researchers have speculated that it was tore down uh, because they were tired of of, of people coming onto the land, uh, trying to look for the house because of the Jeff phenomena. But that's probably unlikely uh, because, you know, it's still out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you really have to – you'd have to walk a long ways to get there. And really, um, uh, not that many people anymore know that much about the whole Jeff incident. In fact, you know, on the island itself – with the exception of um, just uh, 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 some uh, like a local brewery had made an ale a couple of years ago called Jeff the Talking Mongoose Ale, uh, practically everybody else on the on the island has forgotten about Jeff. You know, there's no uh, there's no festivals or parades or you know weekend uh, uh, celebrations of Jeff. Uh, it's just you know he's kind of uh, uh, largely been forgotten. I would be interested in knowing if the house was built on an energy vortex. Uh, well, and because you know, it's 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 interesting that you would mention that because it appears that on that property there were a number of of ancient um, um, uh, uh, menherns, I think, you know, uh, some yeah. uh, uh, what. The, Obviously, had been like uh, a rock formation that had been built in uh, prehistoric times. Uh, there was mm-hmm. definitely uh, an old well that um, uh, had been there uh, uh, even before um, uh, medieval uh, occupations, which you know le- leads people to you know think that it probably was at least a. a, a, a a prehistoric uh, type of well. So uh, there was definitely some kind of, of occupation and, and possibly even uh, 
a site of ceremonial activity, what what some people think. So it's uh, it's it's interesting to speculate that um, Jeff could be a result of some kind of of energy, whether it be ley lines uh, that intersected nearby or, um, you know, a type of, you know, elemental or nature spirit that, uh, yeah, that, uh, that, that exists that's, in the landscape. That's, that's where I was kind of going towards, because remember earlier I said, could he be an egregore? And mm-hmm. if out of loneliness and need for um, stimulation of some sort, if the adults, had that kind of need they could have created something that or they could have they could have added energy to something that was already there to create something like jeff and Mm -hmm. and the more you focus on an egregore the um the more you focus on it the more energy you give it eventually it has a life of its own right so 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 that they could have they could have they could have created Jeff and then lost control of Jeff, and yet Jeff was feeding off of their energy to a certain degree, but he went off to to fairs and to all sorts of things on his own, and you know yes it then came back and told them about it <laughs> the uh, a lot of the things that 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 Jeff would do reminded me a lot of um, what people would used to describe as a house spirit or a spirit mm-hmm. of the hearth. Um, it, you know, it used to be believed that, that every house would have, you know, the a, a guardian of the house or the hearth. Uh, you know, naturally, the hearth would be the, the center of the household. And the spirit of the hearse, you know, would be the 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 one that would help take care of the house, you know, uh, uh, bring bring good luck when needed. Uh, and and like Jeff, uh, the 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 house spirit would uh, uh, oftentimes be known to uh, visit other nearby uh, farms and steal things to uh, to bring back. For his house, and that was something that, yeah. that Jeff uh, uh, loved to do. Uh, he he was a, uh, a, a a very proficient thief, uh, going you know to the other nearby uh, houses. And, uh, well, and in fact, like you said, you know he would often go into town secretly, and uh, uh, especially like the bus station, and would listen in to the conversations of the, the drivers and the mechanics, and uh, he would uh, visit like the churches, uh, and then he would come back and report on uh, what was being said, uh, what what sermons were, were given, and I mean, he would even sing the songs uh, that he would uh, that hear at a lot of these locations. Again, very reminiscent of uh, these uh, the ancient beliefs of the uh, uh, of brownies and pukas and and, and and house spirits. And as long as you took care of them, you know, fed them uh, a bread, porridge, things like that, then they were happy and 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 willing to to do things for you. Uh, and like Jeff, they were also um, eager, uh, 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 easily angered. Uh, 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 Jeff had a very, you know, uh, quick and fiery uh, temper, as uh, supposedly, you know, these these ancient uh, elemental uh, types of spirits, uh, very um, very childlike almost when it when it came to uh their their emotions you know easily to anger easily hurt uh very emotional uh but uh but then also uh fond of you know kind of like very childish juvenile types of of jokes uh jeff would <laughs> oftentimes jeff would oftentimes leave uh 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 feces uh, uh in the kitchen which would just really oh oh my, oh my gosh that would just enrage Margaret uh, Irvy naturally you know she kept a very clean kitchen and uh, Jeff would then go and leave dung 
at some place that she had just cleaned. And he just thought that that was just the greatest joke of all. And uh, Sounds like he's and, bipolar. Certainly you know, sounds well, like he's bipolar. You know, um, one of the one of the things that I have written about is uh, concerns poltergeist and especially yeah. um, uh, talking poltergeist. And uh, you know, you look at uh, um, um, an an event, say like the Bell Witch, which uh, oh, I loved her. Uh, what, what, I loved was her. was. Was a very uh, um, um, you know a very verbose <laughs> talking poltergeist, and there's a lot of similarities uh, between Jeff and the Bell Witch, except that uh, Jeff seemed to really uh, he was never destructive, he was never re- he was never hurtful. You know, the Bell Witch was extremely fond of of slapping people and striking them, and you know just it was very uh, physically uh, abusive, and also you know cursed curse like a sailor. Jeff would curse every now and then, but I mean, uh, the Bell Witch, uh, you know, I mean, practically every other word that she used uh, was was a curse word. But if you look at a lot of these cases of talking poltergeist, uh, their personalities are almost psychotic. Uh, yeah. They, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, they're, they're very prone to, to, to anger one second and then, you know, hysterical laughter the next and then, you know, back to uh, asking to be, you know, forgiven and loved and things like that. Jeff, a lot of times, but weren't, uh, was weren't like they, that. Weren't they worried that they were, that he was going to hurt Vori at one point, so they moved her bed into their bedroom? Yes, early, early on, um, they they really became very concerned about Jeff, uh, naturally because they thought that uh, they were dealing with a ghost or, or a poltergeist, and and Jeff uh, was uh, uh, was was very um, uh, very loud and talkative uh, early on, and and uh, like I said, he cursed a lot, he broke things, uh, his he he was really quick to anger and screamed and yelled. So they moved Vori into their into their bedroom, which really honked Jeff off and made him even angrier. And and he told them, he said, you know, uh you can move her in there, but I can still get at her. I can still I can get all of you. I can kill you all if I wanted to, but I choose not to. Yeah. You know, so I mean, you know, you hear you hear something in your walls screaming that to you. Yeah, you're gonna think the worst of whatever this is. But uh, but eventually uh, things calmed down, and um, they they decided that uh, that Jeff was you know pro- was all talk and not not much action. So they they eventually moved Vori. Uh, 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 back into her room, and you know, for for a number of years, uh, they, you know, I can't say that they lived peacefully together. <laughs> they 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 put they put up with Jeff. Uh, now, Vori, years later, um, she was tracked down by a reporter from Fate magazine. This would have been in the 1970s. She was around 52 years old at the time. After she had left uh, the household and her parents had died, she had just basically disappeared. Nobody had ever been able to track her down. Uh, This reporter was able to find her, and she reluctantly agreed to an interview, though she wouldn't say, you know, where she was currently living, you know, at the time, naturally. Uh, but she told this reporter now, again. I said she was 52 years old. She told this reporter that everything that had been reported to have happened actually happened. That Jeff was real, his, the voice was real. She was not responsible for any of it. Uh, in, in fact, she said that you know people used to accuse her of being a ventriloquist. And she said if I was if I, if I was that good of a bloody ventriloquist. Why would I be working, you know, in this little machine factory for yeah. almost nothing as a salary when I could be on television as the greatest uh, ventriloquist in the world? She goes, it's yeah. just, it's just ridiculous. Uh, but she said though that she wished that Jeff had never happened. She said that he ruined her life. 
She said that uh, uh, she she got away from the island as quickly as she possibly could when she got old enough uh, to ex, uh, escape the publicity. And she goes, she did not want that publicity to follow her. And so she never told anybody who she was. She was. She said she lived in terror of people that she worked with finding out that she was that girl, you know, that Vori Irving, who who lived on the island and was haunted by the Dalby spook. And she said that she she never got married because she was afraid that uh, you know what man would ever want her if they found out that you know she was that girl that she she had been involved in that kind of situation you know so it was it kind of it was very sad actually how she felt that whatever this phenomenon was that happened to her when she was that young um had stigmatized her to the point that she had to live her life in secret you know whether or not that was justified or not it really doesn't matter because she thought that it was and you know, you know it's like she carried that cross all of her life and how different the times are now because mm. i mean it would it would almost be accepted as oh that's so cool i mean i'm trying to sell my house and if i if i said you know it's haunted but it's a great house and you know it might sell better uh, you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> seriously i mean it is. It's kind. Of, I mean, I do have a ghost, but it's a cat ghost, so it's you know, n- no big deal. But and, and the cat will probably go along with me when I move, so I don't think I can guarantee a ghost would stay. But but I think that the times have so radically changed that this kind of um, this kind of a manifestation would be approached so very differently. And and you don't hear about this anymore, you know, things like this happening, actually. I mean, you do hear about polar, poltergeist activity, but they make such a big deal of it. They make it, you know, seem like demons. And so people are making a fortune on stuff like this these days. And it looked like at one point that the Irvings were trying to make some money on it, but Jeff just wasn't cooperating. Well, the Irvings were, were never... Um, were never interested in making a circus out of everything. Uh, they they were more interested in just trying to find out uh, what was going on and 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 trying to prove that uh, that they weren't conducting a you know a, a, a hoax. Uh, Jim yeah. Irving had hoped that uh, the book that Harry Price had uh, had written called the uh, the haunting of Cash and Gap, which by the way. Uh, is is included in my book. Uh, now, Harry Price's uh, book was released in 1935. It sold only about 400 copies. It was nothing. Oh, uh, and then and then was never reprinted again. So uh, I was extremely lucky that Timothy Green Beckley, my publisher, was able to find somebody who who had a copy of this book. You know, very you know, very valuable copy, and w- scanned it for us, and so we were able to include it in in my book. So this is the first time since you know 1935 that that this book has been seen again, and it, it really is a treasure trove of of information that um, has not seen the light of day. You know, in in, in all of this time, uh, so you know, I, I was extremely pleased. That we were able to get a hold of this to be able to to be included in my book, but Jim Irving had hoped that that possibly this book would would sell a little bit better, so he could make something, you know, off of this because yeah. you know uh, uh, Jim actually, I mean, you know, he he put in some money of his own to uh, to help some of these investigators, you know, come to the island and visit. I mean, you know, they they uh, even though that a lot of times they would stay at a hotel um, in 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 Dalby, you know, the Irvings were always more than happy to feed them and and and, and do things like that. So um, uh, when the haunting of Cashin's Gap really didn't go anywhere sales wise. You know, uh, Jim Irving was naturally a little bit disappointed, uh, but I think that he was more disappointed that people weren't 
more interested in what was going on because you know to them this was such a, an incredible thing that you know going on in their household and for the most part with the exception of 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 newspaper accounts nobody else was able to experience you know i mean you you think about it it's, it's like you said earlier i mean if, if a similar manifestation was going on nowadays in a house i mean you know reality television would have a uh, <laughs> you know uh, a a 26 uh, episode season you know, based on on this, Jeff the Mocky Talking Mongoose on you know travel television, <laughs> that you know that sort of thing. Uh, but back then, there was actually there, there there was no really good way to document what was going on. I mean, they did have uh, a, a dictaphones, which was an early form of a recording device, but um, it required electricity. To, to run, and the Irving household had no electricity. Uh, you couldn't even get, say, like a van that had batteries in it to run a dictaphone up to the house uh, because That's there was no right. road going to the house, right? Uh, the closest yeah. that they were able to get were, were these photographs that Vori took um, around, uh, I can't remember now, 32, 1932, 33, something, something like that. Uh, Harry Price had, had actually given her a camera uh, uh, with film, and uh, she convinced, uh, allegedly convinced Jeff to, to make an appearance outside. Uh, uh, Jeff um, would jump onto the gate of the fence just really fast. He, uh, he told her that, you know, be ready. Because you're not going to get a good look at me. I'm going to go fast, so get ready. You know, be ready to take pictures as fast as you can. And apparently, that she exposed the number of plates that uh, she wasn't fast enough. But she was able to eventually get about three or four uh, uh, photographs yeah. of of some kind of creature. Uh, and again, you can you know you can find find it, find these in my my book. But naturally, I mean, it's not going to convince. It didn't convince anybody. I mean, you know, most yeah. people were like. It's a fake, you know. It's a stuffed toy. Uh, you know, she, she took one of her mom's, you know, uh, uh, fur pieces and, and you know stuck it up there. Or you know, it was a, it was a, or you know, one of those dead rabbits. <laughs> you know, uh, you know. But I mean, you know, it, it's 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 very similar. Still nowadays, when it comes to say like UFO uh, 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 photographs. Okay. Uh, I mean, you know, we've got uh, everybody's got carries a camera with them now on their cell phones, and uh, despite the fact that the uh, you know the skeptics are saying, oh well, nobody's taking you know UFO photographs. Everyone's got a camera, but no one's taking. Yeah, no, that's wrong. There's lots and lots of uh, cell phone well, UFO it, photographs it, being taken, but nobody's nobody you know, believes it. It's it's really it's so weird because I've been in this field for a gazillion years. And when something, you know, metaphysical happens, I get so giddy that something's happening. All I can do is giggle, and I never think to take the camera out and film it. Um, I know. <laughs> we've got a caller. Do you want to take the caller? And um, Oh, definitely. Yeah, sure. Okay. Hold on. Hi, caller. This is Barbara. You're on the air. Do you have a question for us here? Hey, Tim. How's things in your neck of the woods? This is Rick Osmond. Well, hi, oh, Rick. Rick. It's good to talk to you. All right. Uh, Rick's a very good and old friend of mine. <laughs> mine, too. Yeah, well, and Rick doesn't uh, doesn't live uh, that far away from me. You know, you could uh, you probably yeah, throw a rock in his general. I'm sorry, Rick. Go ahead. Yeah. We're almost neighbors. Almost. I, like I said, I could throw a rock in your general direction. You could probably hear it yeah. hit. We actually live in adjoining counties, so yeah. So how you been, Tim? I mean, this isn't a social call exactly, but how have you been, Tim? <laughs> uh, well, as, as as you can tell, Rick, uh, uh, always uh, always working hard. Yep, I hear you. You you were mentioning a photocopied uh, book. I'm working on a photocopied handwritten manuscript from eighteen. 40-something. 
Oh, oh really? My. Yeah, this is slow going, but it's um, it's a manuscript that was rejected by the Smithsonian. Must be good oh, stuff then. Well, I can't wait to read that. Yeah, I, I'll have my name on it as editor, and that's about it. I'm not really contributing anything, and it's really slow going. But I'm doing it for Eighth American Magazine, and it's uh, almost 300 pages of handwritten in uh, you know 19th century cursive with 43 spelling different spellings of the same word. And oh that, my that's, gosh! That's my door. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't I don't envy you. <laughs> that task. Yeah, it, it's going to be an undertake. Uh, it is already an undertaking, and I'm digitizing it as I go uh, with that, you know, nasty cell phone camera thing that gives me multi megabyte files for all 286 pages or whatever it is. Right. Well, can I can I ask you? Can you give us a hint on uh, what the uh, subject of this is? Uh, yeah, it's it's about the ancient earthworks, art, and languages of Native Americans, or at least that's mm. see the the languages and artwork as Native Americans. He was not as reticent about saying the earthworks had possibly other origins, which is precisely why the Smithsonian rejected the manuscript. Right, right, huh? And uh, um, is this uh, you know, like central to? Uh, the the Midwest or it, it's primarily Indiana? Midwest. It actually goes from East Coast to uh, to the Rocky Mountains. His research did. Mm-hmm. So, and and how and, did you run across it? Well, actually, Wayne May, the publisher of Ancient American, asked me if I'd take on this task, and uh, <laughs> I wasn't completely aware of what I was agreeing to. <laughs> You foolishly said yes, <laughs> but it, it's an interesting task. It, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah, I guess even rewarding, but yeah, it's not something I want to do for a living. Mm-hmm. Well, when when you get to close to getting this published, let me know. Uh, because you know, as I don't know, uh, Barbara, if your audience knows this, I'm a host of a uh, of a show on a competing network called Exploring the Bazaar with uh, Timothy Green Beckley, and uh, we would love to have you on to talk about this. And plus, I would just I would love to read this book as well. Yeah, I, I would love to have it in a digital form, you know, in you know, modern block letters rather than what it is, because it drives me crazy. Yeah, I will do that. I'll be happy to do that, Tim. So how's the other Tim? I haven't talked to either one of you in, well, I guess years, come to think of it. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a couple of years. Uh, um, uh, we just, uh, I, I, excuse me, I just actually um, finished putting together a, a, a new book for, for Tim Beckley um, about uh, – um, Ghosts and poltergeist and dangerous spirits. Uh, we, have, we haven't come up with a, uh, a a title yet that we all agree upon, but uh, the working title is like you know n- uh, knife knife wielding spirits and demonic poltergeist, something like that. <laughs> but that that should be coming out uh, uh, really soon. We we all we have a lot of contracts. I'm sorry. How about how about nursery rhymes for the dark side? Ooh, there I like that. <laughs> that. That's a good one in Netflix title right there. That is. <laughs> uh, but uh but yeah, this book that uh that, that, that Tim has uh brought got a bunch of people, myself included, Sean Castile and uh, uh um uh, Maria DeAndrea and uh, uh, Sean Robbins uh, got us all together and uh, uh various chapters just talking about, you know, like dangerous and not so friendly, you know, ghostly encounters. <laughs> and I included, I included uh, uh, Jeff, you know, in in one of my chapters. You know, not not th- not that he was dangerous, but uh, kind well, of. Well, wait you know, a minute. I can, 
I can I can attest to the fact that after we did the show about Jeff, the next mm-hmm. two radio shows we did, we lost the archive of it. It took us almost I don't know three four days for them to find where the the actual archive of the show went to. Mm. And we blame Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, it'll be yeah, interesting he, to hear he what happens to the show. Girl, but... Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Maybe Jeff was a Dero. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I didn't really want to interrupt your program, but I just thought it was an opportune time to call and say hi. Glad to hear you're out and about. I knew you were doing, still doing your other show, and. Uh, as soon as I get done with my manuscript, I'll let you know. Please do, and it's and it's absolutely you know fantastic uh, hearing from you. Don't be a uh, don't be a stranger. Well, I'll, I'll get down your way soon. Maybe we should just go <laughs> well, out and do some, some mutual research. Rick, where are you located uh, again? I'm in southwestern Indiana, about 48 miles from where Tim is, actually. Oh, wow. So I'm moving closer to you when I move then. I'm moving That's to right, Nashville. You're moving to. Nashville. Oh, Nashville, Indiana? Tennessee. Oh, Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, okay. Well, you had me excited there for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason I say that is Nashville, Indiana is very close to a place uh, in Brown County a campground, Bill Monroe's campground. And he was old enough to remember Bill Monroe. Mm-hmm. And they have had no sightings but photographs of Bigfoot in the campground. And it's not a costume. Hmm. Wow. Is that recent? Uh, last year. So recent enough. Really? Huh. I don't, think, I don't know if I've run across that. Well, I just happened to run across their website and... Um, yeah, they talk about the Bigfoot sighting as one of their more exciting incidents. Hmm, Can't talk about the king of country music for 45 years, but Bill Monroe. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Well, I mean, I've been to that. I've been to that campground before, and it's. Uh, I could. I could see how that could be. You know how you know people could oh, see. It's the right terrain and everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Huh. Well, I mean, and uh, uh, you know, Barbara, I don't know if you know this, but I mean, uh, um, um, Indiana has has had a number of uh, very interesting uh, uh, Bigfoot cases through the years. Absolutely, and one of close to you, in fact, Tim. Back in I'm sorry, say- there was a whole string of them that stretched from uh, Du Bois up to Vincennes. Yep. That's right. That's right. Well, I mean, when when I was going to college in Vincennes, which it would have been in the late seventies, there yeah. was uh, you know a few uh, uh, Bigfoot sightings uh, closer to the river, uh, just south yep. of the just south of the town. In fact, uh, um, I, w- I went went out to one of those locations and and saw a number of, of footprints. Uh, but the ground was just so so muddy and nasty. I couldn't I couldn't get any kind of you know plaster cast or anything. It just ran all over the place. But yeah, it's definitely definitely activity going on there. Yeah, long term too. It's not yes, just decades, yeah. centuries of sightings. Because Vincent is the oldest city west of the Appalachians, other than New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Yep, well, well, someday and, uh, they'll take it all seriously and really do some good research on it. Well, we try, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, and there, you know, there is good research, you know, being done, and there's been some really good uh, um, DNA evidence collected, and uh, and with some very interesting uh, results. But um, that's as far as it goes. You know, I mean, they yeah. say, oh, well, look at this. You know, we've got. Uh, um, we've got this unidentified DNA. The closest that comes, you know, that that it comes to is hominids, and that's as far as it goes. 
Yeah. You know, nobody else. Nobody else will look at it. <laughs> well, and it's but how come they, Why haven't? Why haven't they found any um, skeletal or scat remains? Then they have found scat, and they've gotten DNA from scat too. Um, yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Scat hair, uh, possibly a fingernail. Uh, they've got skin imprints from mud and car windows and pretty much everything you can think of. And mm-hmm. Jeff Meldrum has uh, accumulated tens of thousands of pages of research just on footprints. Wow. So to say that there's not good research, there's a ton of good research and, and a ton of mm-hmm. good photographs. Yep. But yep. there's no taxonomy in, in the zoology books for it. Yeah. <laughs> However, these are protected species in Washington State. Hmm. Well, it's it's just like everything else that that happens with science. You know, if it doesn't fit into a cubby hole, they don't. They, it doesn't exist. Right, and that's what they thought of gorillas, at least mountain gorillas, until 1903. Mm-hmm. Yep. It was a fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> Even though they were pictured in ancient Egyptian art. Well, I mean, even the uh, even the locals, you know, around where the mountain gorillas lived, you know, talked about them. But uh, you know, the 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 white man was just like, ah, it's just, you know, they don't know what they're talking about. They're not smart like we are. <laughs> right. Well, the same locals were also talking about Mikel and Bimbi, but we haven't done mm-hmm. any dinosaurs. Not yet. Right. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> same. Same with Bigfoot. You know, unless unless Bigfoot is able to uh, um, walk in between worlds, which I think some of them are able to do. Um, Absolutely. Eventually, eventually, we may be able to. And I'd hate to see this happen. You know, get a body or, or maybe even capture one at least temporarily. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah what about probably... a baby root for a photograph? I'll give you a baby root. I know you like it. <laughs> <laughs> Fifth Either yeah. that or, or, or one of the political parties will get them to vote. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Only the dead ones. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. No. But the uh, the Bigfoot in Brown County, and, and like I said, the, that one string of sightings that happened in 81, 80 or 81, um, it crossed three counties and had uh, at least four hair samples taken from various residences where it was trying to get in the house. Well, that, that, that was... To me, say that that there is there is an intelligence there that is that is, you know, not exactly animalistic, but it's there's an intelligence there. Oh yeah, it's um, I I just my estimate, and I don't know that I could base it on, you know, facts, figures, science, or whatever. Just observations and surmising that there isn't they're at least as intelligent as a twelve year old human. They could be far more intelligent than any human, and we wouldn't know it because, mm. well, if they are that intelligent, well, we will never know it. <laughs> yeah. Let me yeah. ask you something then, because primitive man going back hundreds of thousands of years used flint and stuff like that. These, these Bigfoot seems to be far more intelligent than primitive man was. Are there any sort of tools or implements that they have discovered that that they use? When you say they have discovered, who do you mean by they? Do you mean Bigfoot investigators? Investigators. Uh, yeah, Bigfoot yep. investigators. Gerhardt, um, Meldrum, they all have samples, uh, specimens of things that are presumed to be tools or accoutrements to. I'll use this term loosely, Bigfoot, Um, yeah, communities, that's the right word. Um, Mm -hmm. Cordage made out of cedar bark, Um, woven 
cordage made out of cedar bark. Oh, um, wow. Um, stones have been broken, edged, edged tools, I guess would be the right word, for possibly scraping hides, although there are no, no incidents that we know of of them actually using hides. Haven't found any evidence. Um, they use rocks as tools to open up logs or mussel shells or well anything that they can't just pull apart, which means it's you know pretty strong because so are they. Um, yeah. Uh, they use sticks as tools. They they throw rocks as weapons, not just to people either. Um, they probably throw sticks as weapons. It's never been observed, at least not to my knowledge. That doesn't mean nobody's seen it. Um, they, I believe, and I, I don't know how to prove it. I don't even know how to test it for sure. But I believe they can see further into the infrared spectrum than humans can, which is one reason they're so adept at avoiding infrared cameras. You know, a one-year-old human knows what a camera is. They yeah. like to ham for the. If we ever get that one Bigfoot that likes to ham for the camera, we got to. <laughs> <laughs> well, are there, has, is there is there any been any indication as to whether they are you know vegetarians or if they eat meat or what it is they they eat. They all eat anything Probably. except cold. Yeah. They don't like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're they're op, they're oppor, opportunists, you know. Yes, they are. Yeah. They'll eat carrion. If they're hungry mm-hmm. enough, they'll eat carrion. Um, they kill and eat deer, and mm-hmm. and not just the liver. Well, that's the part they like the best, apparently. Mm-hmm. Um, they dogs. they raid that, they raid human gardens. Yeah, and you can human chicken coops too. But yeah, oh yeah, well, they're uh, orchard, they're oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, Salt Salt Fork Creek in northeastern Ohio has um, a, a state park there, and the state park lodge had um, apple trees around it. And one of the workers there observed a family of Bigfoot. She would set the youngster up in the apple tree, and he'd eat one, throw one down, eat one, throw one down, till they were observed, and then off they skedaddled. But they did this. You know, all late summer because that's when the apples were. On. They've had wow. a number of sightings up there too. But you know, they've been so good at um, avoiding being captured on on film and <clears throat> or even recordings um, for so long. I mean, I don't blame them, frankly. I would I would consider that I I would consider that we would seem so primitive to them that that you know they'd want to stay away. Well, and, the other thing is people who've had encounters that were not um, uh, adversarial on yeah. either side. Uh, those people were almost never carrying things like cell phones, binoculars, guns, a hammer, no tools at all. Uh-huh. So they're intelligent enough to stay away from people, at least who are armed. <laughs> well, I'm glad of that. Yeah, me too. I, you know, I can't say that about anybody in Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> but we've, I mean, so many animals have gone extinct because of us. And our neglect and our stupidity. And I'd hate to well, see the Bigfoot going extinct. Yeah, despite our best efforts, we can't get rid of cockroaches or mosquitoes. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> saying we're responsible for the extinction of all these species might be overstating the case. <laughs> well, there, there are some, some species that are, are dwindling slightly here and there. Yeah, certainly. Um, Elephants, poachers, rhinos, poachers, even kangaroos, poachers. Yeah, I'm not saying that none of them are suffering because of um, poachers. They're not suffering because of the trophy hunters. 
the trophy hunters are paying big money to some country or another to get their trophy. Uh, Forty-five, fifty thousand dollars for an elephant that was on its last legs, anyway. Um, and yeah, they're going like twelve, fifteen hundred of them a year. Wow! And they're reproducing faster than they ever did in South Africa. So I'm not. You wow. know, trophy hunting is not the problem. Uh, plastic in the environment—that's a big problem. Um. Herbicides, insecticides, wide spectricides, those are all problems. Well, Rick, are, is Bigfoot, the Yeti, Sasquatch, are they all the same um, breed of animal, or are they different breeds? I mean, are, do they well, appear to all kind of be? There are at least two different species, not just breeds. Different species because their feet are species, different. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, we have the the true what we call the Sasquatch out you know Pacific Northwest type. They're huge, and so are their feet. Their feet are generally shaped kind of like a human, but of course they're wider. And uh, according to Jeff Meldrum, they have a whole additional set of joints in their feet. Uh, they actually have five more bones in their feet than humans do, according to him. And that's not because he's had a foot to take apart. Either. It's just from the footprints that they leave. Uh-huh. Um, in the south, you have two different species, two different foot types. You have one that's closer to the, to the Sasquatch human foot. And then you have another one that's closer to the African-style apes, you know, with the, a thumb on their foot, kind of. Um, cool. And there may, actually be, there may actually be a third species, mostly in Canada, but also uh, upper Midwest. And mm. it is, uh, you've heard about this one, haven't you, Tim? <laughs> yeah, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah, it is, it's, uh, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, three-toed critter. But... <laughs> But it's a human-shaped three-toed foot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, Mo- Momo in uh, in Missouri yes. had three toes. I, I got to talk to one of the original witnesses of Momo, too. That was pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah Isn't, it so cool? <laughs> Isn't it so cool that we still have stuff like this around? Yeah, it is. I think it is. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, wherever, yeah. you go, wherever you go that the natives will talk about Bigfoot, they also talk about the little people. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> it, you know, it's it's inevitable that it, it goes to that. Um, I talked to some of the tribes, well, all the tribes I've talked to, at least in the Midwest and Northeast, they say, oh, yeah, they're still around. They're still a pain in the ass. <laughs> The Seneca well, believe that I, all the, Go ahead, Barbara. No, I was going to say, I truly believe in the little people. I talk to them all the time. They don't talk back, but I talk to them. <laughs> well, they there are um, accounts, uh, narratives, where there, there were detailed conversations between normal-sized humans and smaller-stature humans. Um particularly around Lookout Mountain uh, and in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. And and I'm talking, okay, late in the previous century, 1990-ish, they were still at it. Um, And the Pukwudgie in the Northeast, although they are true pains in the ass compared to the others. They are the ones well, who gave them the tricksters, I think. Yeah, <laughs> well, and you got the you have the uh, the Pukwudgies in Indiana as well. Yeah, but it's actually Pukwudgie in the Algonquin, uh, mm-hmm. which is another interesting thing because the last two syllables are genie Pukwudgie. 
Mm-hmm. And, and the Arab <laughs> genies are little tricksters with, you know, all the same descriptors, but they can grant wishes, supposedly. Of course, that's the whole trickster part of it. <laughs> and that's that's one of, that's one of the aspects I talked about in the book about about Jeff, you know, whether or not he was like a a jinn or or trickster type of of entity, because you know, he seems to a lot of the stuff that he did kind of falls within that genre, so to speak. <laughs> yep. Well, there was. Uh... And and there are differences in behavior that these differences are apparent when you change from one region to the the next. Like, for instance, in northeastern Alabama, near the town of Mentone, there was a lady in the 1930s. Um, she she was – sorry, I had a fly bite me. She was uh, <laughs> raising a garden, and um, – Something kept stealing stuff out of her garden. So she stayed up late at night and saw a two-foot-tall woman with a one-foot-tall child Mm -hmm. taking produce from her garden. So she started leaving them out other foodstuffs and eventually established an acculturating friendship with them and invited them in to eat at her table. Mm -hmm. And and made little tiny dresses for the little girl. Aww. <laughs> so when she died in the seventies, late seventies, her niece inherited the property and the little people, which had grown in family size, family unit size. So. There are still no photographs, which I find mm, disconcerting, but I think there could be photographs. That would be well, that maybe. would be interesting, you know. Um it, it, it seems like people are, are are more inclined to accept the reality of say like, you know, Bigfoot or Sasquatch, but when it comes to Little people, feral little people, whatever you know, pygmies, whatever you'd want to you know call them, then you know you're kind of like back in the uh, back in the '60s with the reality uh, of Bigfoot. People would just like scoff at that. Little people, no way. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. But now we have maybe... Homo Florian. Homo who? Homo Floriensis, the Flores Flores Island hobbits. They're three feet Hobbit tall. people. Yeah. Ah. Well, you know, so, a lot of these little people, though, are, are really able to be invisible. They are almost dimension shifters in, in many cases. So that... Yeah, so that great at camouflage. Yeah. No, I, I, I totally believe in them. I haven't left anything out for them lately, but um, I do believe that they're there. When I bought this property here, I was going to plant huge gardens until I discovered I was built on a gravel pit. And um, I went out and I talked to them every night, and and I have a garden that looks like it's been here for 100 years. Hmm. You know, it was basically, I need help here, so, you know, let's get to work. (laughs) <laughs> and they do. Yep. It was very I, I much like um Well, it's sort of like Findhorn. The little people work there too in Scotland. Yeah. yeah. So and, and they're still I don't very think you much like being cold Well, probably not. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to know what to call people these days. You know, there's there's always a term that be, that's been used constantly that is now an insult. So right, like fay. Uh, the fay. Yeah. Uh, that was originally a derogatory name. But then they they started playing all those tricks and people started hating it. Well, but 
Well, I guess, you know, I, you know, I get the feeling that they play tricks on people that really don't believe in them anyhow. Well, they, yeah, they might be trying to uh, make their point. But yeah, we're real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad well, you showed up little, tonight. <laughs> well, thank you. The little people on on uh, Lookout Mountain, when the Cherokee were being forcibly removed by the United States Army under direct orders from Andrew Jackson, um, the little people came to the aid of a group of squaws and children who were trying to evade the soldiers. Hmm. And they tied strings around the soldiers' ankles <laughs> in heavy dry underbrush and lit the strings on fire. Oh. And the soldiers ran down the mountain in a panic. And the squaws and children escaped. Well, that's really cool. <laughs> well, especially for the squaws and children. Not so much for the mm-hmm. soldiers. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, these, yeah, these 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 parts of our reality that, that that people just, you know, kind of write off are are definitely still still actually there and a part of nature and a part of our our whole ecosystem. And you know, if you, you can ignore them and you can negate them, but they're still there. And if you work with them, you know, it, it they're not all tricksters and they're not all you know, out to, to, you know, be devilish. Um, I, I think that, that they, they can be helpful too, just like the ones that well, help the squad. They they could be. Yeah, the Seneca of Western New York, um, their reservation surrounds a particular, I'd call it a river valley, wide creek here in Indiana. Hmm. Um, and it has a mineral deposit that that uh, oozes out of the side of this cliff, bank, the banks of this river slash creek, which are precipitous, steep, tall cliffs. And they call that the leftovers of the magic because their little people live in those cliffs deep in the ground. Hmm. And that is their effluent. I'm not going to go into what that means in this case. (laughs) But uh, they believe very firmly that it has to do with the effluent of their magic spell. Their their magic manifests in their landscape in that way. Okay, that sounds good. (laughs) Once again, though, I mean, here you have this connection with the little people and the underground. Oh, yeah. Oh, and not just yeah. that, but the sense to believe if they do not honor those little people, their society is going to go to crap in a handbasket. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, it's just, to me, it's always interesting how, you know, you, you can travel all over the world and find these very similar stories uh, amongst, uh, well, I mean, amongst people. people. All the descriptions are exact. They're not just similar. Yeah. They are made yeah. I I don't see any other way to um, negotiate it away. You, you just can't rationalize mm-hmm. it. Yeah, people do. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure that Hayesville has their share. Sorry for mm-hmm. Bob's listeners. You don't know what Hayesville is, but Tim sure knows. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's when it comes to you know the little people. I mean, I I, I think that you have something that is so subtle. I guess it would possibly be the right word that you know for for most people they could really be almost standing right on top of them and never notice. Yeah, you know, we're so we're so involved in our modern lifestyle that um, you know we have no idea what's what's going on all around us. You know, I mean, uh, you have something like say, you know, Bigfoot, uh, just due to the sheer size. 
that you know if it you know accidentally is seen then it's really seen but some of these you know like the little people um not as easy <laughs> not as easily seen yeah they they don't apparently don't even live above ground they appear mm-hmm. above ground but they don't live above ground mm mm-hmm. mm but there also seems to be more than one uh, society, variety, breed, whatever you want to call it, of little people. And this is going by uh, stature, size, um, do they wear clothes or not, mm-hmm. um, uh, uh, do they grow food or they just steal food or are they hunter-gatherers? In the case of the Flores Islanders, they were hunter-gatherers, but they were taking down pygmy elephants. 15,000 years ago. And, you know, we're oh. talking about people who were three feet tall and they were hunting elephants and taking them. Hmm. Well, granted, they were pygmy elephants. They're only eight feet tall. <laughs> yeah, but that that's still proportional to the size of the, uh, oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the hobbits. <laughs> they were, and, and that particular uh, part of Southeast Asia, because then, 13, 15,000 years ago, it was not an island, mm-hmm. not entirely. It had been an island. It had gone back to being part of the continent then had been an island again. Um, then they had pygmy elephants because it had been an island for a long time at that point. But the humans probably got there by boat, including the little people. Mm-hmm. They, they were not just, uh, you know, civilized. Uh, uh, I don't know, civilized might be too much, but they were not just savages, barbarians, because they made tools, they made weapons of stone, um, and they they did, you know, team hunting, community hunting. They also did weaving. Apparently, that's just mm-hmm. starting to come out. Probably haven't even seen any papers about that one. Um, they did not yet have. Uh, pottery, but then nobody else did either. Um, you know, they they were they were humans. They were just tiny humans. Tiny humans. But they were three All feet right. tall, and the ones on Lookout Mountain were two feet tall, and the ones in uh, northern Scotland and Ireland, we don't know for sure how tall they were. But we've probably, all three of us, have probably seen the photograph of the little guy in a sitting position who was mummified inside a clay jar. You've seen it. He was 19 inches tall. Yeah. 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 Found out west. To be, yeah. And he was estimated to be 60 years old. And he was x rayed. And it was definitely real. And then he disappeared. <laughs> now, fortunately, fortunately, the pictures are still around. Right, and so are the X-rays. Right. <laughs> That's, you know, well, I think it's really it. cool. Oh, you yeah. know, so the 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 internet is is so phenomenal because it's as far as I'm concerned, even as a teacher, knowing all of this information is out there that the schools aren't doing anything with it, and and at least when people get curious enough, they will start taking a look at what is available on the Internet. Um, just just occurred to me that actually we're running out of time. So um, <laughs> I do want to thank uh-huh. Rick Osmond for calling in and educating us. And um, uh-huh. then I get Good you back on, you, on the show for, an, for another Good interview you. as well. And um, Tim? Thanks so much for being here. And um, oh, my pleasure. I, I, you got a couple more books I'm going to have to read, and, and we're going to have to sit down and talk about. Um, both of these gentlemen have some of the most amazing material available out there. Rick, Rick has um, Graves of the Golden Bear, which is the best book out there in the entire world if you want to learn about the beginnings of, of what American history has been you know, hidden from us in plain sight. And uh, 
Gaps the Talking Mongoose is, is a fabulous book as well, but there are also books on Tesla and Admiral Berg and all sorts of other things that Tim has written, and, and I strongly urge you to read the material that both of these gentlemen have written and published. It will give you an education far beyond anything a college could do for you, and it will enlighten you as to the planet we live on and our responsibility towards it and the history that hasn't been taught. So thank you both guys for being here. This has been 